Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 7.30 a.m. to 8.20 a.m. session of the 2020 Open Simulator Community Conference. In this session, we are happy to introduce a panel discussion called SceneGate, Echo Voice, and I'm a Box. Our panelists are Lisa Laxton, Frank Ruloff, and Seth Nygaard. Seth will join us if he's able. Lisa Laxton is the R&D visionary and CEO of the Open Simulator Community-Focused Foundation Infinite Metaverse Alliance, IMA. She is also president of Laxton Consulting LLC with experience providing various virtual world technology solutions for education, research, business, and defense clients. Frank Ruloff is a senior systems engineer at Thales Netherlands with expertise areas in training and simulation. He is leading the research and innovation activities related to open simulator technology within the Thales Global Company using multiple open simulator grids focused on user needs. Troy Schultz, aka Seth Nygaard, is a multi multidiscipline developer with 30 plus years experience in real-time systems for industrial, automotive, and other critical environments. He has worked in the roles of senior hardware designer, senior systems administrator, engineering manager, and chief technology officer at various companies and was the owner-operator of the Open, Simula Open Simulator Refuge Grid. Please check out the website found at conference.opensimulator.org for speaker bios, details of sessions, and the full schedule of events. The session is being live streamed and recorded, so if you have questions or comments during the session, you may send tweets to OpenSimCC with the hashtag OSCC20. Welcome everyone, let's begin the session. Thank you for joining us and congratulations to the OSCC team for another great conference. It's both a privilege and a pleasure to be here. This panel will provide updates and discuss several ongoing projects, avatar-focused viewers for Open Simulator, a new voice application for Open Simulator, and Docker-based Open Simulator grid deployment. Let's get started by talking about the current development state of SceneGate. Project SceneGate encompasses both SceneGate and future viewers that are avatar focused. The COVID crisis had an impact in 2020 on the development team slowing our progress. We also have multiple requests for new capabilities and features regarding the armature and the user interface. These will need to go through team review next year after IMA white paper submission. The process is defined here. There's a link in local chat for you. We plan to move the repository to a GitTIA server we will host to reduce cost and ease administration in the future. Work is underway to support three user operating systems. The build has been updated to support using the Visual Studio 2019 Community Edition. The Future Viewer project that Frank will talk about will help provide architecture documentation for developers. Following up from our security testing last year and white paper review, work has begun to improve the viewer security. Before we talk about security, let's take a look at the current roadmap. We did have to slip our milestone on the project roadmap. I posted a link to that in chat. But we very much appreciate the user feedback and have included some bug fixes for the next beta release. Integration with Echo Voice that Seth will discuss is planned if he's able to join us. If not, Frank and I will provide an overview for you. We also want to expand our team to spin off what we call the Dreamgate project. Firestorm is a popular viewer among creators and advanced users due to some advanced features. However, creators with certain disabilities using Firestorm 
could be digitally marginalized by missing accessibility features. So we have two choices. Collaborate with the Firestorm team to add SceneGate's accessibility features or fork Firestorm for our team to issue another viewer. We prefer the first choice, so we don't need to maintain a second code base. I've opened a dialogue with Beck to see if we can collaborate. In either case, we need testers and coders, so if you're interested in joining the team, please contact me. Longer term, we want to add advanced tools to SceneGate so users with accessibility needs will be able to use either viewer. SceneGate has mostly the same features in Firestorm, absent area search, and a few other creator features. It is my daily viewer for everything except when I need to use area search. On voice, currently Vivox does not have group IM or conferencing in Open Simulator, but this is one of the Echo Voice Roadmap items. We may need viewer or server code changes, but we hope to handle this in the Echo, Echo Voice bridge applications. If needed, our team is happy to provide input for OS devs and other viewer devs to include in their development framework. We need help to get the Echo Voice work done faster. So if you have C++, C Sharp, or Golang code expertise, specifically Golang, please contact me. On usability, we want to look at disabling or removing the Analyze button for mesh uploads to eliminate user issues. And because users often use the map to find other users, we want to investigate removing NPCs from the maps and the radar. Chromium-related updates for media streaming are needed. And finally, work will continue to decouple menu options tied to Second Life and to address bugs. And that's because the SceneGate projects are dedicated to Open Simulator. Whew. Lots of work. So let's look at the current issue tracker. We really appreciate the participation from the community on issue tracking. Two issues are resolved. Four open issues are to be addressed in the next beta release. One issue needs team review after white paper submission. That is regarding the armature. And three issues related to Linux users needs to be investigated. You can download the viewer here. There's a link in local chat. And our issue tracker is currently located here. There's a link in the uh, local chat for that as well. In 2019, Natasha did a lot of source code security investigation regarding third-party libraries. The chart on the left shows vulnerabilities for all three major operating systems. As you can see, third-party libraries used by Mac showed the greatest vulnerability. Third-party libraries are often used to accelerate development, but that comes with a price. Often not kept up to date, these libraries are one of the most insecure parts of an application. Hackers began to move away from servers and operating systems in 2016 towards applications. 90% of all applications require download of these components, making exploits attractive to hackers. The more third-party libraries used, the greater the vulnerability of configuration management uh, if configuration management is not in place. Given Natasha's research results, it was clear we needed to update the current libraries. Configuration management means keep them up to date and eliminate the ones we don't need. Developers can no longer afford to use third-party libraries without also keeping track of the library's updates and security profiles. We won't know the configuration management cost until we complete the initial updating of the existing libraries. 
based on our survey, the majority of users in Open Simulator are Windows users, so this set the priority. Take a look at the chart on the right. She submitted a white paper for team review and then proceeded with updating third-party libraries. This chart shows her progress made. Great job to Natasha and Frank. The team will continue that work for all three versions, but this is a methodical and incremental process to make sure we don't break things. New source code is not in the current repository, but will be updated when testing is completed. This will likely coincide with the repository move to Katia. Frank, what do you have to share about the Future Viewer projects? Thank you, Lisa. And hello to all of you. Um, can you give me the next slide, please? Sure. The, the on the roadmap, the successor of the Seagate viewer is defined as the future viewer. Uh, we explained a little uh, last year what we want to reach. First of all, we want to reach a number of things. Um, we want to um, disconnect the rendering part uh, of the rest of the viewer, which allows to have a um, stable update rate for the viewer, um, which means that uh, headsets will... Uh, 3D headsets will have a better um, performance. Uh, with the unstable uh, frame rate, people can get sick using that headset. So that's one of the reasons. Other reasons are to have plugins uh, for different voice of IP servers to adapt your user interface uh, to the needs of the, uh, the group or persons that are using uh, the um, the uh, the viewer and um, so for instance if you have a certain training you want to do and you want to have certain commands in directly into the user interface you can do that and the third part is to have an independence of the uh, ap interface with the uh, with the open sim server in the sense that we can control the way how the viewer evolves now uh, we are busy with red square at the moment uh, three students, interns, are busy uh, trying to analyze, which is uh, quite a, a job, trying to analyze the current SceneGate code because there is no documentation. Uh, that is uh, difficult. Uh, they found the documentation from Second Life, uh, the Second Life viewer, and they used that as a reference to see where in the SceneGate code the rendering part exactly is. We also want to implement as a first part a new rendering engine, but will be the Godot uh, rendering engine. The, the, the selection of that was, first of all, it's, a, it's open source. Secondly, it's a very live community. Um, so what, uh, what work that has done until now is that we identified, or the students identified, all the different functions that are related to, um, that are related to rendering in the, in the viewer. And now they can compare it with the needs, the functions, when you use Godot functions, what the needs will be uh, on the uh, on the viewer side with respect to interface and changes. So the next step is that we are gradually going to change the SceneGate viewer to incorporate the Godot functions. That is what we're doing. At the same time, uh, given the fact that uh, uh, we didn't have any documentation, they also work on uh, providing a complete document on all the functionality that is in the SceneGate viewer for design purposes. Um, uh, and the first step was to, uh, to uh, get an overview of all the functions in and outputs using the Doxygen uh, application. And that's one of the work. So in the next, uh, in the next time, in the next uh, period, we are going to, um, to uh, change the code of the SceneGate viewer to connect it to Godot and of course all kinds of uh, do all kinds of uh, performance uh, uh, testing to see whether that will work or we need more changes uh, to the code base to be able to do that. That's for me. Uh, back to Lisa. Thanks, Frank. 
Okay, let's see. Uh, Seth had some connection issues, so I'm not sure if he's able to join us. Uh, so we're going to do what we can to try to present some information from Seth. So let's talk about Echo Voice. Uh, the Echo Voice project, uh, originally VCOM wrote an add-on solution for Open Simulator. Uh, this was like 11 years ago. Um, and also, uh, Thales worked with VCOM to uh, sort of do some updates to provide a little bit better uh, quality. So when we got together with Thales, we took a look at that. Um, Part of the problem was it wasn't really um, written at the time for the hypergrid. Uh, there were also some security issues that we found. Uh, but to look at very specific observations, zero CI is a component which requires a commercial license when used commercially. And this is sort of uh, a problem for a lot of grids that are non-commercial or education grids that don't have a lot of money. Uh, there are significant number of security vulnerabilities that um, if you're on a closed grid, uh, you can sort of mitigate those issues uh, like Thales is, uh, but it's not upgradable to the current Murmur Mumble server code. There have been, according to Seth, 18 um, different issues of Murmur since this add-on was written. Uh, we looked farther into that and found there was hard-coded part uh, used between the client and the viewer. Uh, that is something that would obviously have to be changed. Um, based on this old version 1.2.1, uh, that's a big problem. Uh, it was not done in a way that there was a proper API so that it could be easily updated. Uh, it also requires packages and protocols that are no longer available. Uh, we're talking Microsoft 2008 um, and uh, the old uh, protobuf. And there were also technical issues with Open Simulator that we noted during our testing uh, on a local grid. So we came to some conclusions as a team. We talked about this. And obviously, it's not suitable for public grids as is because of all the security issues. And the code base itself was not sustainable. This is in addition to the commercial license uh, complication. So what we decided to do was to make a jump forward in development for compatibility and sustainability. Uh, we're developing a new Echo Voice solution designed to address all of these known issues. The current Murmur Mumble uh, server code that is out there has already resolved all the uh, security issues that were observed. So this is a look at a diagram that uh, Seth shared with me. Uh, it sort of covers uh, not only the existing, but what we'd like to do in the future. And if you look at the diagram, you'll see that the, the cyan or the blue colored arrow line is pretty much how that add-on works right now. Uh, users would not be able to switch back and forth between Vibox or Echo Voice. Um, they have to manually uh, make these changes and change their viewer, log in, log out, uh, which is complicated for users. And um, also, the add-on itself uh, is shown in the blue boxes over on the right part of the diagram for the regions. Uh, obviously, we're going to need to make changes to the add-on. So that's written in C-sharp. We're going to have to rewrite that. Uh, but to allow for bridging so that users will not have to worry about whether they're uh, arrived in a region that's running Vivox or that's running Echo Voice, we hope to eventually make that automatic so that it is detected and the changes are made for the users. Uh, this is going to require a server bridge application development. Uh, Seth's intent is for that to be written in Golang. Uh, and also, uh, we're going to have to have a server-side application uh, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, the server-side bridge uh, is not only to bridge the um, 
add-on module, but also for what we call non-avatar users. Uh, so a non-avatar participant, someone who is coming in from another virtual world, uh, who is coming in via phone, uh, who is coming in uh, just as uh, someone who listens or as someone who actually participates. And that future auth server, that red box that you see on the right, would be the path that they would be able to get in that way. Uh, I also see this as a way we can bridge uh, various virtual world platforms, users participating on those to sort of achieve that uh, notion of an infinite metaverse. So I hope this would be really interesting and I wish Seth was able to join us because I know there are people who have already been asking us very specific development questions. We'll do what we can to answer them. Uh, and we can certainly uh, refer Seth in at a later date uh, if we can document any of the questions that people have. So the next project, uh, which I mentioned briefly in the last couple of years, so it is something that we wanted to do. Uh, we've made a lot of progress on that project. So we're going to be very soon introducing something called I'm a Box. And I'm a Box is an extension of the research concept that uh, Moses had done, uh, where they had a Moses in a box uh, from the military uh, open simulator project. And But what they did was they said, okay, we'll take a virtual box, uh, we'll make a virtual box image, and they just made an image of uh, a small Moses grid and made that available to educators. And that was great, but we, we had some other research questions about that, and there were some definite issues. Moses was based on Simeon Grid. It was not accessible to the hypergrid. Um, that wasn't even doable. They were never able to get that working. Um, the Docker implementation at the time uh, was not suitable for non-technical administrators. administrators. There's been a lot of work that's been done uh, with Docker since that time, as Robert talked about uh, last year. Uh, but we also found uh, that it was difficult for non-technical users to scale this because it wasn't uh, distributed in any form. So we did some research in 2019. Uh, we evaluated using multiple VMs uh, in a distributed approach. And we found that this was suitable for small grids uh, from a performance perspective, because what would happen after about 20 regions, uh, you then began to run out of CPU and RAM resources because the virtual machines uh, require a lot more um, resources for themselves. Uh, and there were network configuration issues for multiple machine architecture if you wanted to begin to deploy VMs on actual other machines, especially in data centers. So this could be cost prohibitive very quickly due to CPU and RAM resources. It is doable, but really only suitable for small grids. So in 2020, we extended that research uh, evaluating Docker solutions uh, as an alternative. Uh, we compared the Docker implementation and bare metal performance. And the conclusions were that it was lower in cost, it was easier in, to administer, and it was comparable in performance to bare metal as long as you tweaked it properly. So we then began development of a Docker-based IMAbox installer, and that is well underway. And let's take a look at the concept here. So what to put in the IMAbox? If you look close at this diagram, you basically you divide it up into three areas. Uh, you have your grid core simulators, you have grid services, and you have system services. Now, what Seth has recommended, uh, based on his own uh, testing on the server, uh, he does a lot of analysis uh, with the external tools, but he decided that implementing traffic on the system services uh, was a really good solution, uh, especially from a security perspective. Uh, and he also uh, talked about the different components of the grid services 
uh, that really need to be separated out into their own uh, robust instance. Uh, FS assets was an obvious one, uh, but also inventory. And we'll talk more next year about why that is important. Uh, and then to separate the robust core to its own Docker container as well. So all of these blue boxes that you see here have very specific uh, functions uh, in the overall scheme of things. Uh, and we have been testing this heavily. Uh, so we know it works very well. And what we're hoping to do is to wrap this into an IMA box that we can then provide to the community. This would be a platform agnostic uh, installer, uh, whereas DreamGrid, which I love, is a great project, but DreamGrid is based on Windows. Uh, if someone wants to launch this in a data center, uh, Windows servers are very expensive. Linux servers are very cheap, uh, so it makes more sense to have a uh, platform agnostic uh, approach uh, because you can run Docker inside VMs, but you can also run Docker on bare metal. Uh, so doing it this way then allows you to have your simulators also in their own individual Docker containers. Now, obviously, we need to uh, come up with a way to programmatically uh, make this installation very easy for the users, and we're working on that. So I hope that this is something that would be really in interesting uh, for folks to implement. Uh, if you're on a Windows machine and you want to implement an IMA box, you would uh, use something like VirtualBox as a hypervisor that's free. There's no commercial license uh, restrictions. Uh, and then you would just load uh, Docker and then Docker Compose and then begin to load the images for the various containers. Uh, we want to make that um, as automatic as possible. Then uh, if you're on a Mac, same thing would be the case. If you're on Linux, then you know, just go ahead and load them on bare metal. Unless you want to run those inside a Linux VM, you can do that as well for separation. So um, I think that's uh, what we wanted to do was to keep uh, our presentation slides uh, down to a minimum. And that way we would have more time for questions and answers. So here we are. Questions or comments? OK. Well, that was very interesting and very technical. There are a, f a couple of questions. Um, and this is a question from Sidearm for Lisa. Uh, how does your work with voice relate to current issues with VBOX and other traditional voice services in current production use? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, here's the thing. With with uh, VBOX or VBOX, uh, they are a third party uh, when it comes to voice communications. Uh, this is a significant issue for businesses. Uh, for defense clients uh, that may have military um, security requirements. It's the same security requirements also exist for uh, the healthcare industry, uh, for counseling in virtual world, or for educators, uh, you know, because they have FERPA regulations that they need to comply with. So when we looked at, at Vivox or Vivox, that wasn't suitable. It wasn't a good solution. Uh, now, there are a couple of grids who are running their own Vivox servers, um, but there are still that third-party intervention uh, that would not allow you to meet both HIPAA and FERPA regulatory uh, framework. So uh, Echo Voice is something that you will be able to self-host if you have those security needs, and it is encrypted by default. So we are already well beyond uh, anything that Fivox could offer. And also, uh, when you think about Echo Voice, one of the things we have on the roadmap is not just the private voice conversations or IM, but group IM, uh, which could serve as conferencing. And this is something that Fivox does not offer. So we're hoping that Echo Voice becomes a really good solution, not only for the open simulator community, uh, but also for other virtual world platforms. 
uh, because it won't be limited to use by Open Simulator alone. Okay. Um, there are a few people who are asking again how they can help uh, testing. If there's an, a link that you can post again. Yeah, well, the best way to help in testing is uh, to get in touch with me, uh, to attend our weekly meetings. Uh, we host on uh, the Metaverse Depot Grid every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time uh, in the IMA Outpost Alpha region. And um, you can reach me via email, uh, lisa at infinitemetaverse.com. Uh, most of the people can find me uh, one way or another, you'll find some way to find me. Uh, worst case, if you need to reach me, go through Selby. I know he has a lot of followers and a lot of contact. Selby is there every Wednesday night for our meetings as well. Um, we have not uh, put together I'm a Box uh, where it can be downloaded uh, yet because we're not ready. And Echo Voice is the same situation. The bridge application, uh, we did have a protocol uh, or, or a prototype that was done uh, on the client server bridge. Uh, we did test that with uh, all of the viewers, uh, and it does work, but it has to be configured manually. Uh, and we really need to get away from that because that's not good from a usability perspective. So uh, I'm hoping that we can get this done as quickly as possible, and that's why we're reaching out to the community asking for help uh, to work on the development so we can get it finished. Yeah, to, to, to add uh, to add something, we we um, we I think uh, we have uh, three people uh, together working on it now or going to work on it, but uh, it will take time. So uh, if there are any people that can help with uh, with the development, uh, that would be uh, great. Okay, uh, I have another question from uh, Sci Traveler. I hope I said that correctly. Are there any expectations about when we can expect a working voice function to test or even use? I can't say right now because of the complexity of developing the new bridge applications in Golang. Uh, Seth has been really, really busy. He's only one guy. That's why we need some help. Uh, we do have a couple of people who are looking into that. I do have a volunteer uh, to handle C Sharp. Uh, but she is non-open simulator, and uh, we really need to have some open sim expertise. Uh, there was another question that Sai asked. I'll go ahead and address that one. Uh, okay. free, free switch integration. Um, here's the thing. Free switch does work with open simulator. It works very well. Uh, the Moses team uh, did a lot of tweaks to come up with a suitable... Uh, implementation of free switch on their grid, but there are some issues uh, from a user's perspective. Number one, uh, the lips are not going to move on the face of the avatar that's speaking. Uh, if you're using free switch, there is no indicator above the head of the avatar speaking to indicate to other people who is talking, uh, and there is no spatial sound uh, component. So for meetings and classes, uh, presentations, free switch is fine. But, it, you know, there are usability issues, but most of the virtual world's uh, uses are really going to want to implement spatial sound. Uh, so this is the re real reason why we said, okay, let's look at the uh, VCOM solution. Okay. Um, I have a question from a little uh, further back in the chat from Andrew Hellershanks about Simeon Grid implementation, uh, and there seems to be a question about whether that's still being used. Yeah, I think that was actually answered by uh, another person in chat. Okay. Yeah, I Austin talked about that. The Simeon Grid components were removed. Okay, so that's not the from case. From 092. Okay, and then we have a question from Tony from YouTube. Um, I wonder if I'm a box is going to have a web viewer like Moses was going to have. 
Well, you know, actually, uh, Kay talked about that in the last presentation. This is something Frank and I had been talking about as well, is to virtualize uh, Seengate uh, for our users. And, and we're look, looking forward to getting some information from Kay's IT team to see how they did the implementation for her project. But that was the very same uh, approach that we were also looking at as well, because there are a lot of people who can't download the viewer uh, if on institutional systems, and there are the mobile components. You know, people on tablets, people on phones, they really want to access virtual worlds, even if it is a limited capability uh, where you can't build, you can still attend, you can still dance, you can still go shopping. That would be our goal, is to make sure that we could do that. The, the Moses, uh, if I may, the Moses viewer itself, I've been in contact uh, with uh, the people that uh, have been starting, but the Moses viewer was not any near a real application uh, at the moment they stopped. Right. Um, so uh, having a web viewer based on Java scripts and is not something that is even available, was even available on the Moses uh, team. It was just the design they were busy with. It's one Correct. of the things, the, one of the things that I've been looking at uh, because in our company, uh, we had uh, we want to distribute uh, the, uh, the the grid over the over the uh, company's internet, uh, and for that we looked at three reasons. We looked at three different approaches. One is the the current approach. You have the servers, and you have a viewer running on a PC. But mm -hmm. uh, our uh, company uh, worldwide has about fifty thousand PCs, which means that the IT organization, when we have an update of a viewer. It gets very busy. So that was, from a management point of view, was not the, the best way to go. The second was to have a web type of application like the Moses was. So we got in touch with the Moses team to talk about that. But first of all, uh, it meant to, to, re to write a complete new viewer. So we cannot use anything that is, is there. We have to really completely write it again. And secondly, there were still doubts about the performance of such a a web viewer, uh, if you compare it with the current viewers uh, on the graphical side. So, and the third uh, option that we've looked at uh, was to do the rendering in the cloud, and uh, similar to what uh, what uh, Lisa uh, uh, mentioned, which is in principle uh, a very nice uh, uh, solution because you you can make use of the maximum um, graphical power that you have running in your uh, cloud. Um, you have uh, video streams and uh, touch, uh, touch uh, keyboard strokes uh, that go to that cloud, which means that you have a, a very good security, uh, which is important for my company. Uh, but on the other hand, it's an expensive, uh, it's an expensive solution uh, because you, you need to have servers that share graphical cards, GPUs, and then you come in the, 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 the hardware of NVIDIA, or you come uh, to VMware that all uh, have crazy high uh, licenses cost to use this uh, kind of hardware. So that's right. more a problem of a uh, more a costly problem. But from a technical point of view, that would be the best because if you can do it like that, you can run it on phones, you can run it on, uh, on tablets and you can run it on PCs and it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, what the graphical capabilities of such a PC or laptop is, you can run it nearly always. Right. So we 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 have been we have been looking at that, and uh, um, yeah, for now we are going because we probably have for this uh, third solution. Um, we have running. We have uh, in the company we have uh, have two major grids running: one in Paris. And one in uh, in, uh, in my uh, company's uh, part, um, which we use for experimentation. It's run a virtual machine um, and a number of other virtual machines around it to support uh, OpenSIM. One is a um, web server that allows you to upload content from your directories, uh, all kinds of content, uh, whether it's spreadsheet documents for presentation, as you see behind you, so we can present all types of documents, uh, pictures, movies, uh, we can share screens, we can do all kinds of things. So that are uh, different uh, virtual machines. We have a virtual machine for whiteboards that uh, we use the AOBA whiteboard uh, 
application so that we can share whiteboards in, uh, in, in virtual space. And we have a, a fourth uh, virtual machine uh, that should run Echo Voice when it gets uh, ready. Right. And, you know, uh, on our side of the house, on the IMA side of the house, one of the things that we are looking at with the Echo Voice Bridge applications is to extend that uh, to implement, integrate with Jitsi. Uh, and Jitsi would then provide an open source uh, solution for file sharing and screen sharing and that sort of thing to uh, really make Open Simulator a one-stop shop uh, that not only uh, users can use, but also uh, school systems and uh, government agencies, uh, public and private sector businesses. Uh, we, we know that there's a lot of struggle out there right now uh, because of COVID and people all of a sudden who had been shy about remote work are forced into it and they're, they're finding that their users are overwhelmed and exhausted with the number of different tools that have to be used uh, and they're exhausted in Zoom meetings with the level of distraction behind the users. Uh, it's really taking away from the focus of the topics of discussion in those meetings. And when you use virtual worlds, uh, you eliminate that factor. Uh, you also have a psychological aspect where um, if, if I'm in a, you know, 50 Zoom meeting conversation or 49 uh, on Teams, then uh, I'm reminded by design every, as I'm looking at the screen constantly that I am separate. I am remote, I am removed, I am isolated. But when you're in the virtual world, you get that sense of spatial presence and that sense of togetherness. And that is a big factor why I believe virtual world is the way that everyone needs to go for the future. And if we can provide a nice platform that is a one-stop shop, that's the right way to go. Okay. I, I have a question and then there's uh, another one if there's time. Um, but you've just kind of hit on something that I heard you say about bridging different platforms mm -hmm. for us very non-technical folks. Uh, I'm just wondering how that might look for the user. Would we be able to, say, teleport from Open Simulator to ScienceBase or to Second Life or something like that? Is well, that what you're talking about? No, uh, teleporting is, is uh, a, a protocol issue between the platforms, and this is because there's a lack of uh, industry standard compliance. Um, I, I would love to see Open Simulator become compliant with industry standards uh, in the future, uh, as well as other platforms, so that we can have that level of interoperability for the users. But we can't do that right now. And I don't foresee that happening in the in the near future. What we can do is the communication, the social component. Uh, if say if you're in a web world, uh, imagine that those five people sitting around in that web world could then interface with the people that is in Open Simulator. Uh, right. Just, just to be able to communicate back and forth. Now, we, we bounce around the idea of flipped webinars, uh, which is really community meetings, uh, mm -hmm. where we might video stream, uh, you know, one user in that web world would show up on a prem in the open simulator world and somebody is streaming from the open simulator world and then that shows up on uh, whatever type of uh, method they use for accepting a, a video stream URL in the web world. So there is a way that we can provide some level of bridging between these virtual worlds uh, until there comes a time, if ever, uh, that the different platforms become industry standard compliant to provide users with that interoperability. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for uh, for that. Okay, and then there's uh, one more question, and we have just enough time for one last question. This is from Jaga Meredith and uh, Abby Worlds, and uh, the question is, is one of the issues um, the change in ownership for Vibox, that they will attempt to monetize it? This is kind of back a little bit in the chat, but um, I think it had to do with the voice. Yeah, well, that could be. Uh, we started um, to look at Echo Voice 
not directly from that uh, perspective, but to have an alternative for uh, Firefox or any other, uh, in case Firefox would, uh, we started it before this happens. So we, we developed it as a, a fallback, um, first of all, for, uh, for grids that do not allow uh, Firefox as the voice of IP, which is, for instance, for my company, we cannot allow Firefox to be the uh, provider of audio. And secondly, to have an alternative in case uh, something that uh, like Firefox falls away. Now, whether whether that's going to happen now when they're taken over, I don't know. But um, the intention for us was to find this alternative, yes, for those two reasons. First, as a fallback. Secondly, for those grids that do not want to connect to Firefox. Yeah, and, and there's also um, uh, licensing issues associated with Vivax, uh, where right now they do provide a lot of free uh, voice services to open simulator regions. There are license restrictions. Uh, most people don't read the license uh, terms, uh, but if you did read them, you would find out that if your region is has commercial activity, which is very broadly defined in a legal perspective, uh, they can then demand a commercial license fee. Uh, the other aspect is because uh, they are providing a lot of free open simulator uh, voice services, uh, who's to say that some executive, especially with after the IPO, isn't going to go walking through and find that server in the closet or under somebody's desk that is providing all of those free services and say, hey, what is this? Uh, we're not making any money off of that. Shut it down. Uh, we we have no control over that. So yeah. that was one of the reasons why uh, I thought looking uh, at the VCOM solution was a good idea. Uh, but because VCOM is not involved, even after we met with them, they were not interested in in uh, open sim open source uh, contributions uh, to continue the project. Uh, that's why we came up with a new name and decided to take up uh, the helm on that ourselves. Okay. Okay. Well, we are about out of time. Um, so I would like to thank you, Lisa, Frank, and Seth, for a terrific session. As a reminder to our audience, you can see what's coming up on the conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. Following this session, the next session will begin at 8.30 a.m. in this keynote region and is entitled Whoso pulleth out this sword of this stone and anvil is rightwise king born. Also, we encourage you to visit the OSCC 20 Poster Expo in the OSCC Expo 3 region to find accompanying information on presentations and explore the Hypergrid Tour resources in OSCC Expo 2 region, along with the Surreal Museum region and the sponsor and crowdfunder booths located throughout all of the OSCC Expo regions. Thank you again to our speakers and our audience.